why don't you first each just take two minutes just to tell us um, who you are, what you've been doing for the last 15 years, and what your main focus is. Want to go first, Adora? Oh, sure. Uh, so I have been uh, working with Environmental Health Trust for almost a decade now. Uh, and we are a scientific nonprofit. And thank you so much for that introduction. It, it, it really is true that there are many groups that are working on this, um, really in the fight, just as there are many environmental issues. But this has become the most important issue to us right now because it is just so important. So I'm excited to be talking about 5G and wireless and, and children. And uh, we have a lot of resources on our website about kids and wireless, how to reduce your exposure. I know Allie will be talking about her incredible books I'm so thankful for. We have recommended books, including um, her book as well. And I am just, uh, we're working. We've got a, our lawsuit, which you mentioned, is a legal action against the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, because what it comes down to was with all these environmental toxins is we don't have adequate safety limits. So the FCC made a decision to keep their 25 year old limits, which were based on industry group uh, rec guidelines actually that we adopted after the EPA was defunded from researching this issue. And yet the FCC decided to keep those in 2019. So our lawsuit, our 14 petitioners along with Children's Health Defense and um, uh, Safer Phones as well are, is about the lack of the adequate review of the scientific research. Because the research confirms that wireless radiation has harmful biological effects at levels much lower than what the government states is the safety threshold. And there is a substantial documentation. I'm sure we'll be talking about that. There's science there. There's also an incredible amount of money that companies are, are funding um, are funneling into media outreach and PR and downplaying the science and all kinds of interesting uh, gov government situations, which I'll talk about with the CDC and the EPA and the FCC, where we have our government agencies as captured by the industry that they're supposed to be regulating. So I'm excited to talk about 5G and cell phones and all that. Thank you. Um, so my thank you, Theodora. Um, we have worked together in the past. And of course, I'm a big fan of EH Trust. So, um, you know, it's lovely to be here tonight with everybody. Um, so I'm Dr. Ailey Cohen. I am a, uh, a trained, uh, Western trained internist, um, rheumatologist, um, and then went on to uh, get, uh, become trained in integrative medicine. Um, with Andrew Weil uh, and his colleagues um, at the uh, Andrew Weil Center for Integrative Medicine. Um, and then at around the same time also began understanding um, through a very sad story actually, which is the introduction in my, um, my consumer book uh, with my co-author about, uh, you know, the same time I was learning about integrative medicine and training in that for two years, I also um, was managing the illness of my dog and trying to figure out why he was exposed or what he could have been exposed to that made him so sick with something so unusual. Um, and so that kind of launched my career, my work, my mission, my goals, my anger, my frustration um, into the world of environmental health. Um, so essentially, I am now educating um, as many people as I can through books, um, but also I teach um, high school classes. I, I'm working with colleges, huge, uh, hopefully a big college soon with a big project. Um, I'm trying to get this information out to regular everyday people through a platform called The Smart Human, um, which I post on Facebook, The Smart Human, Twitter, Instagram. There's a podcast, The Smart Human, where I interview very interesting people in environmental health and research and medicine. And I'm really just um, about education and I don't sell anything. I don't endorse anything. 
I keep it squeaky clean in order to keep my message um, filled with integrity and without bias. And, um, you know, my goal is really to educate people on, on potential harm and risks to many environmental exposures, not just radiation, which we're going to be talking a lot about tonight, but certainly environmental chemicals, synthetic chemicals, BPA, phthalates, flame retardants, uh, microplastics, air pollution issues, um, how that may play out in terms of future climate change issues. Um, I also talk about integrative uh, issues that are related to environmental health, which is stress and sleep um, and um, managing diet and nutrition, which is critically important in terms of preventing exposures, uh, harmful uh, uh, effects of, of environmental chemicals. Um, and we have great studies on that. So. Um, you know, I look at the big picture of environmental health um, as a means of really breaking it down into sections of what people should and could and, and may be able to use. It's all about empowerment. It's practical, very simple, um, very smart changes people can make, nothing um, costly, um, just common sense information based on vetted scientific data. So I'm happy to be here and whatever we decide to talk about, I'm in. And uh, so thank you again for having me. Okay, again, Ailey's website is called thesmarthuman.com, thesmarthuman.com. So I hope everyone will write that down. And when you have a chance, go look at it and sign up to stay in touch with her so you can follow up with her after this lecture. Okay, so uh, first question. Um, I, I have one for each of you. Uh, Ailey, I think I have this right but maybe you could tell me, I have written down that you said we have had 90,000 chemicals added to our world over the last 200 years. Um, how many, what is it, is that the accurate number? How many of them have been banned after they found out there were problems? And should we be concerned that they, all these chemicals have been introduced and are they affecting our health or contributing to disease? And then Theodoro, Theodora, um, how many studies have been done on the dangers of cell phones and wireless radiation? And what did these studies say? What is the summation for all of us that are not gonna read them? What is the summation? So if you could each answer those questions. Heavy hitters. Okay, so really I'll try to give some interesting statistics. You hit on some of them. So it's estimated 90,000 at this rate that we're going because about 1,000 to 5,000 are introduced every year. But the fact is we don't know because the industry, the industry of chemical production is unregulated, unmanaged, chemicals that are allowed in all of the products that we like in this country, which includes cosmetic chemicals, cleaning product chemicals, toys. Um, there are some limitations on phthalates and toys since 2006, but in general, even overseas, we get toys that come over here that have heavy metals in terms of cadmium um, and um, mercury and lead. But all of the chemicals that we are allowing into the country were upwards of, are upwards of 90,000 plus. Some people would argue up to 120,000. Um, there's about a um, thousand to, like I said, a couple thousand uh, introduced each, each year into the US market, into all the products we like. Um, there's about 15 polymers that are patented each week. Um, there's about a thousand now known endocrine disrupting chemicals out of that pile. Um, I say known because again, these are being tested by third party um, institutions, nonprofits, NGOs, and academic institutions internationally with shared data. So, um, you know, we basically have really, after the 1950s, particularly, um, had an explosion of um, synthetic chemicals, including pesticides that were, you know, went, you know, crazy at that time, plasticizer chemicals, flame retardant chemicals. Um, bisphenol compounds um, and um, just a variety of chemicals exploded at the time, the age of chemistry, Monsanto promoted it. Um, it was certainly a reduction in the use of um, natural resources. Um, food storage did benefit. We did have the ability to send food overseas to troops. We have the ability to store food. We have a lot of benefits like um, plexiglass and airplanes and naugahyde and rayon and formica and you know just a variety of, of words you're going to recognize that we use in our all of our household you know um 
uh, and, and, you know, travel and, and that kind of thing. But we did, we did go nuts and the chemicals were never tested or required to be tested before going into the products we use. Um, even today, personal care products, cleaning products, even our um, food, added, food additives, um, very limited in terms of regulatory oversight, in terms of testing for toxicity or safety. Um, and so we'll get into that maybe a little bit later, but the idea is that we really have a runaway train here. And what we're doing now is we're finding out that the chronic low dose exposure of, of particular chemicals that have been well studied um, are turning out to have um, both acute and chronic health effects. And, um, and that's really the basis of the work I'm doing is to teach people where these chemicals, what they are, where they reside, and very practical ways to reduce those exposures that we now know from many great studies, occupational studies, um, a variety of studies. Um, so, so that we can do this, we can actually do this and not wait for um, industry regulators, which there are none, uh, laws which are not getting passed uh, to really do that work. We have to do it for ourselves and empower, excuse me, empower ourselves um, to, to have safer lives through uh, less exposure. So I'll hop on to what you are saying and add in that the synergistic effect between all of these chemicals and electromagnetic fields, non-ionizing electromagnetic fields is uh, so, so important to talk about in, in light of all of these thousands of chemicals, which um, we are being exposed to every day. So just like chemicals with, elect with electromagnetic radiation, I'm talking about non-ionizing, so I'll talk about wireless 5G as well as the lower frequency magnetic fields, extremely low frequency fields as well. Um, there was no safety testing when they were, when cell phones were first came on the market over, well over two decades ago. The safety limits are set, as I talked about earlier, based on industry groups guidelines, based on heating only. If it heats you, it harms you not looking at a lot of the other effects uh, that were found at the time. So you asked how many studies are there? There are thousands of studies, thousands, going back to the Cold War and World War II when uh, Russia and actually United States were putting money and had scientists in the military and in the federal agencies looking at the impact to radar technicians and to their servicemen. So uh, this research going back decades shows some of the effects that we're finding now and still trying to uh, raise with the powers that be so that they acknowledge it. However, it's going unacknowledged. The transnational authorities that are making decisions about what's safe and what's not safe are saying that heat is the only harm even though there's CIA research, there's research from the US military showing headaches, neurological effects, reproductive impacts, um, impacts to the heart as well, yet it's being ignored because of the captured agencies that we have in, in the US government, the US FCC. We'll, we'll see what happens next, but it's a similar trajectory. You asked about the science. Um, there is a, so when the United States, just taking us as an example, when those limits were set back in 1996, the US FDA um, asked the National Toxicology Program to study the long-term effects, saying in their nomination that we don't have research on what the long-term effects will be from exposure to cell phone, wireless radio frequency radiation. And they asked the National Toxicology Program to do large scale animal research. That took years and years. It, the studies have come out from the National Toxicology Program. You can go to the National Toxicology Program, search cell phone radiation, and you'll see where they talk about the clear evidence of cancer and the DNA damage, which they found in the animals. There also was heart damage found in many of the groups. It's not even on the page, but well discussed in the peer review and in the documentation and in the, the large final reports. And now the FDA is saying that 
it's just animal studies. It doesn't apply to humans and they're not, um, they, they don't think there needs to be a change in our limits. So um, just as another example of some research, the long-term research that's looked at people who use cell phones to their head for what was termed heavy use at the time, which actually is um, about half an hour, less than half an hour a day, uh, had significant increases in a type of brain cancer. And those same types of tumors in humans are the kind of tumors that were found in the National Toxicology Program animals. There's also research showing damage to reproduction, testes development, sperm damage, impacts to the brain like memory damage. There's research on kids, teenagers who use cell phone for many years, I'm sorry, for just one year, but for those who use it heavily, when they held the phone to their head, the researchers did uh, studies that investigated the, their memory that lodged in that part of their brain that would be most exposed to the phones and found damage to memory after just one year. There's research on animals that has found damaged brain cells and decreased brain cells. And so that's why I got involved in this issue because of the documented science we have on our website at ehtrust.org, pages dedicated to talking about the science and what has been found, including, I mean, a, a Yale study that, that just came out, one of several Yale studies that found increases in thyroid cancer in people who are genetically susceptible. So this issue of genetic susceptibility is it's never even considered in 1996 when our limits were set. 